So you love the idea of investing in short-term rentals, but are you stuck on how exactly you're supposed to choose a market to invest in? If this sounds like you, then you need to watch the rest of this video. We're gonna talk through the three P's for choosing a market for your short-term rental. And by the end of the video, we hope you feel a little bit more confident enough to choose a market to get started in. So one of the questions we get all the time is, Tony, Sarah, how do I choose the right market for short-term rentals? Now, we'll start by saying that choosing a market is a pretty personal decision, and what's important to us as the Real Estate Robinsons might not be as important to you. But what we've done is that we've created kind of a framework that we believe anyone can use to help choose a market to launch their own short-term rental business. This guy created it. He's yes, a genius. I created it. So we call it the three P's of market selection. The first P stands for policies. The second P stands for popularity. And the third P stands for profits. So let's dive in and break down each of these three P's. So the first P of market selection stands for policies. We start with policies because this is the most critical part to creating long-term success as a short-term rental operator. If you mess this up, then literally nothing else matters. So you have to get this step right. Because even if you choose the best property and you're one of the world's best hosts, none of that matters if the policies of that market don't support short-term rentals. So what exactly do we mean when we say policies? Policies are the local ordinances that govern how short-term rentals operate within a market. So basically, they're the rules you have to follow as a short-term rental host for that specific market. So super important. Policies dictate all kinds of things about that specific market. Things like the cost of acquiring a short-term rental permit, the set of requirements that a property has to meet to even be eligible to obtain a short-term rental permit. Whether or not there's a limit to how many permits can be issued at any given time, what parts of town a short-term rentals can legally operate in, what kind of fines are charged for violations, the process for revoking a permit for someone that's continually violating those policies, whether or not short-term rentals are even allowed in the first place, and literally everything else associated with obtaining a short-term rental permit and staying in compliance. Now, sometimes policies are set at the city level, other times they're set at the county level, but usually that's about as high as it goes. There aren't any state level or federal level policies, at, at least that I've seen. Now, let us ask you, the viewer, a really, really important question. Would you rather invest in a city that A, has no short-term rental policies in place, or B, has policies in place, but the policies are very, very strict? Now, some of you who are watching might be thinking, Tony, Sarah, the obvious answer here is A. Yeah. Why on earth would I pick a market where the policies around short-term rentals are super strict? Why, God, why? If you chose A, you are 100% incorrect. <laughs> now, we actually prefer markets that have very clear and very established policies even if they're super strict, and here's why. All right, let's use a real world example so that it's a little easier to follow. Let's use the city of Las Vegas, for example. So everyone knows that there are millions of people that pour into Vegas every year to visit the Strip and stay at all the hotels and casinos. Well, we looked it up and Vegas gets about 42 million visitors each year. Like. We know that, right? So now let's say that the city of Las Vegas all of a sudden decided to make it really difficult to get and keep the permits required to run a casino. Say that 25% of the casinos decided they don't want to deal with the headache of going through all that, so they just give up and lose their permits. So now that means only 75% of the casinos are left. Does that mean that only 75% of the demand is left too? Right? Does that mean that the 42 million visitors magically decreases to 31 million visitors just because the policies changed? Absolutely not, honey. Say it again, baby. Absolutely not. Say it for the people in the In back. a British <laughs> accent. No, that's not what it means. What it means is that those 42 million visitors now actually have 25% less options to choose from, which means less supply. And if demand holds steady while supply decreases, it actually means the prices go up and the 75% of the casinos that were willing to jump through all the hoops and do all the crazy things to keep their permits are the ones that benefit from the change. The demand in a market is completely separate from the policies in that market. And the same principle applies to short-term rentals as well. 
Now, on the flip side, let's say that you chose a market that has zero policies. It's the wild, wild west. There's no rules and no policies. But the truth is, investing in a city with no short-term rental policies whatsoever is super, super risky, and here's why. It's not a matter of if a city will develop short-term rental policies. It's just a matter of when. So let's say you start investing in a city that has no short-term rental policies and you buy up a bunch of houses and you're killing it, making you know tons of money. And then one day you hear that the city council finally decided to create a new ordinance about short-term rentals. And the decision that they've made is that they're going to ban short-term rentals Ooh. altogether. Oh my God. So this is why we prefer to invest in mature vacation rental markets where the short-term rental policies are established and we know exactly what to expect. So in order to find out what the policies are, you can literally just call up the city and ask to speak to the department in charge of short-term rentals. You can also even Google the city name plus short-term rental ordinance or short-term rental permit. And oftentimes you can find the information right on the city or county website. We've even, like we were looking into Big Bear and we were driving right past uh, the city, city hall. City hall and we're like, Arr! and went and, and spoke with them in person, you know, so. And they were super helpful yeah. to answer all of our questions. Now let's move on to the second P of market selection, which stands for popularity. popularity. Basically what we're talking about is how many people are traveling into that market on an annual basis, like how popular is it as a destination for travelers? Let's look at another example. Grand Island, Nebraska has 26 active listings in that market and revenues between 12,000 and 15,000 a year. Now, even if Grand Island, Nebraska has short-term rental policies that are extremely favorable towards short-term rentals, a total of 26 listings and revenue of $12,000 per year lets me know that it's just not that popular of a place to travel to. Now, no disrespect to our subscribers who live or we invest love there. We love Nebraska. <laughs> but the data just doesn't support the kind of thriving short-term rental business that we look for. So for comparison's sake, Joshua Tree has over 1,074 active listings and Pigeon Forge has 2,360 active listings. So one of the benefits you get when you invest in markets that are more popular is that there's a, a strong infrastructure to support your short-term rental business. In Joshua Tree and Pigeon Forge, we have plenty of cleaners to choose from, plenty of handymen to choose from, and plenty of other team members really who know and understand the short-term rental space. A second reason popularity is important, and it's because, you know, this is my belief, is that it provides a little bit more stability to your business in the long run. Now let's look at Pigeon Forge. People have been traveling to that region, the Smoky Mountains, and renting out cabins for decades, like long before Airbnb and Verbo even existed. So that means even if for whatever reason, Airbnb and Verbo go away, people will still have a need for vacation rentals in that market. Now, one thing you might be thinking is, what about oversaturation? I don't want to invest in popular markets because there's just too much competition. We get this actually a lot, right? So here are our thoughts on it. If a market is popular enough, I think we're still pretty far away from reaching the point of oversaturation. Now, let's look at another example here. The Smoky Mountain National Park, which is right near Pigeon Forge where our cabins are, sees about 12 million visitors each and every year. Now, millions more people travel to the region but never actually enter into the national park, right? There are about 6,000 active listings surrounding the Smoky Mountains National Park between Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg. That's a huge difference yeah. between the visitation and the number of short-term rentals. So there's even less actual competition than what you think. So, all of that to say, if you're not investing in short-term rentals because you think that the market is too saturated, change that way of thinking. Find the data to support the oversaturation and usually when you go looking, you probably won't find it. But we also need to consider whether or not it's popular with you. And what we mean by that is, is it a place that you can actually see yourself visiting? We don't necessarily believe that you have to love the place, but as the owner, you're gonna have to visit your property from time to time. So you have to ask yourself, are you gonna dread driving or visiting this market whenever you need to check on the property? And if the answer is yes, then maybe don't choose that market. We invest pretty heavily in Joshua Tree, California, but it's definitely not our Favorite place to vacation. <laughs> We've uh, learned to love it. <laughs> right? Uh, we're more of, you know, kind of the tropical places and destinations. <laughs> and Joshua Tree is a desert. Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't get much more opposite of a tropical destination than the desert. But we can still appreciate why so many people enjoy going to Joshua Tree. And, you know, we don't mind driving out there to take care of our properties. So that is the second P of market selection, which is popularity. 
But before we move on to the third P of market selection, we'd really appreciate if you guys could give this video a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, hit the bell for notifications. We're still a new channel and every new subscriber really does mean a lot to us. So if you're enjoying the content, please subscribe. Also be sure to connect with us on Instagram. I'm at Tony J. Robinson. She's at Sarah Rad. And if you're on TikTok, you can follow us there. We are at the Real Estate Robinsons, just like our YouTube channel. We've also got a totally free download for all of our subscribers. If you head over to alphageekcapital.com forward slash calculator, we've put together a free tool that helps you analyze short-term rentals that you're considering purchasing. And last, if you're not yet an Airbnb host, you can sign up using the link in our description. You'll get a small cash bonus for signing up. We'll also get a nice little cash bonus for referring you. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll give you a shout out or something on the channel. The third and final P of market selection stands for profit. Cha -ching, cha -ching. Profit measures what kind of return you're getting on your money and your return is usually calculated with your return on investment or ROI for short. The formula for ROI is taking your annual profits and dividing it by your initial cash investment. Your revenue is your gross income, all the income that you made on your property and profits are what's actually left over after you pay all of your expenses, like your principal, interest, taxes, insurance, cleaning fees, all those things. Another benefit of measuring ROI is that it helps you not get sticker shock when you look at the purchase price of a potential property. You can spend $1 million buying a property or $100,000 buying your property. And I think most people would see the $1 million price tag and think that they're overpaying. But what if I told you that the $1 million property gave you a 35% return and the $100,000 property only gave you an 8% return? Which one is a better investment? This is a real question for your wife. I would pick the $1 million one. Am I right? That's the right answer. <laughs> But yes, my absolutely amazing, beautiful wife is totally correct, right? You'll spend more money to buy the $1 million property, but your return is four times bigger. But just know that identifying your ROI is the last and final step for market selection. So those are the three Ps. We'll finish off with a few quick action items to help you identify your market. Action step number one, identify a few potential markets based on places you've traveled to or places you like visiting or places that you know other investors are already having success in. Once you have a short list of markets, action step number two is to validate the regulations are favorable towards short-term rentals. And from there, step number three is to start analyzing deals in those different markets. So after you've analyzed a few deals in each market, you'll get a better sense as to which market will give you the kind of returns that you're looking for. And it's that simple. Yeah. That's it. So again, this is the method that's worked for us, but it doesn't mean that that's the only way to choose a short-term rental market. So feel free to take the pieces that you like and throw out the pieces that you don't. If you have any follow-up questions, just drop a comment below. We'll do our best to answer it. But that is it for today. I'm Sarah. I'm Tony. And we are the, the Real, Real Estate, Estate Robinsons. Robinsons.